Hey, you guys got your Bibles today? You guys ready for the Word of the Lord? All right, come on, get your Bible in hand. I'm going to get down on my knees and go before the Lord together in prayer. If you'd like to stand, you're welcome to stand. If you'd like to stay seated, you can stay seated. Maybe you want to kneel down before the Lord and humble yourself like I'm about ready to. You are welcome to do that. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we're so grateful for all of the great things that you've already done in this church service. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be in your presence, God. Thank you for your grace that you've already poured out upon us, Lord. Graces of healings and miracles and breakthroughs and words of wisdom, words of knowledge, God. The things that you've already been doing in the hearts and the lives of your people today, God. We just want to say thank you. We appreciate your presence in this place already today. Father, we don't want to stop there. We want to go farther with you. We want to go deeper. So, Lord, today as we open your word, we pray that you open us up to receive it. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Today, God, we open ourselves up to receive the word. We silence our souls to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves only. Oh, no, Lord. We would ask it upon all the churches here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't care if they're Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Assemblies of God, Foursquare, Church of God in Christ, Evangelical Free, uh, Adventist God or Catholic Lord, the Messianic Jewish congregations. God, if they're preaching the gospel, lifting up your name, Lord, we would ask that you bless them. So bless the great churches out that are out there, God. Bless Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. God, we ask that you would bless citizens and sandals and the way, God. We bless uh, Journey in Redmond, Journey in Ben, God. We would bless Elevate Life and C3, Lord God. We bless all of our brothers and sisters. Uh, we bless the Rock Church of Temecula, Lord God, and all of the wonderful places where the Word of God is being delivered. Lord, Hub City Church, God, we bless them in the name of Jesus. And pray, Lord, that your spirit, your presence would be in the midst of your church just as it is with us today, God. Lord, we also want to remember the persecuted church, as it says in your word, Lord. We pray for them as if chained with them. God, encourage them, strengthen them, heal them, deliver them, Lord God. May they endure to the end, to the glory of God. It's in Jesus' mighty name we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Today, as you're having a seat, get your Bibles and go with me to Colossians, the fourth chapter, we are going to actually close out the book of Colossians. We're going to go through some verses, and I'm going to warn you ahead of time today, there are a lot of verses that we're going to cover, but I believe that you guys are able to receive. I think that you guys are smart, and I think that you guys are wise, and that you guys have the Spirit of God who is the teacher today that's going to lead you into a greater understanding of these verses. The title of today's message, this is part number one of a series that we're going to be doing called The Lord's Work and Workforce. Once again, the title of today's message is The Lord's Work and Workforce. Now, as we've gone through the book of Colossians, it's taken us some time to go line upon line and precept upon precept. And as I was looking at these last verses in closing, the Apostle Paul starts to talk about the people that are with him, people that are working and doing the work of the Lord with him, alongside of him. Some of them he's giving them job assignments. Some of them he wants to know uh, things that are taking place, and so he's making sure that they ask the right questions. Some of them he's just saying, hey, greet them, welcome them. They're going to welcome you. They're going to greet you. Uh, just telling them kind of what's going on, who's doing what, and who's where. And in the midst of this, as we read these verses, it's easy for us sometimes to kind of turn our brains off and say, oh, well, he's just saying what's up. He's just saying hello. He's just kind of greeting people and kind of closing out and doing the church thing, you know, and, and, and recommending and commending different people and that sort of a thing. And we skip through these verses and don't really see that God has something to say to us in the midst of all these verses. How many of you know that God doesn't do anything by accident? How many of you know God has purpose in all that he does, right? These verses are no accident. They're not just there because he was just saying some greetings and God said, well, I'll allow that to stay in the Bible. No, God knew that these men and women would be around the church and would be around the apostle at this time and that he was going to start saying things about him and there's still an inspiration that is coming forth from the Holy Spirit that applies to you and applies to me today. As I read through these verses, I want you to take a moment every now and again to look up, to take a look at the overheads. Most of the time we say, hey, look in your Bible, get acquainted with it, know where it's at, know what's being said, that sort of a thing. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Maybe you got the digital version and you want to just put a little highlight where I've highlighted or maybe make a note or something like that. And, and I want you to just take a look at the overheads because I'm going to highlight some words as we go through these verses. And I want to draw out what God is really saying about the work of the Lord as well as the work force. Let's read it 
read together in Colossians chapter number 4. Like I said, a lot of verses. I'm going to read in verse number 4, and we're going to go down through verse number 18 at the end. And we're going to close out Colossians in this series. Here we go in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 7. It says this, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. Now stop right there for a second. Notice this man, right? He's got a great commendation from the Apostle Paul. He says, this guy Tychicus, he's a special guy. He is a beloved brother. He's a part of the family of God. He's a Christian, and we love him. But not only that, look at what he goes on to say. He says that he's also a faithful minister. In other words, you can count on this guy. He shows up. He does his job well. He's trustworthy. But then he goes on, and he gives him one more commendation. He says this, that he is a fellow servant in the Lord. He elevates this guy. He lifts him up. Who is this man that he's talking about, Tychicus? Well, this is the guy that's carrying the letter from Paul to the church at Colossae. Can I tell you like this? This is Fernando. It's the mailman. Praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? He's just the postman. He's just bringing a letter from one place to another. But he says, this guy is a beloved brother. He's a faithful minister. This guy is a, a fellow servant of the Lord. This guy is elevated. This guy's really something special. Goes on in the next verse, and look at what he says. He says, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Verse number nine, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Now, he was also a slave. If you read in the book of Philemon, you'll find out that this guy was a runaway slave that came and got saved under the Apostle Paul's ministry. And now Paul is actually sending this slave back back to his master, and he has some strong words for Philemon in the book that bears his name. You can read about that on your own time and find out what all the drama is about. Some of you guys love drama, right? They will make known to you all things that are happening here. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome. And this is Mark, the same Mark, John Mark. This is the Mark that bears the name of the gospel book, Mark. He's the writer of the gospel. He hung close to the apostles, was close to Peter, was close to Barnabas, was close to Paul. And here, Mark gets a commendation. Well, we wouldn't have thought that would have happened because Paul at one time was traveling with Barnabas, and Barnabas brought along his nephew, Mark. And now Mark, he he was a homebody. He was a mama's boy. And and as he got away, he got a little homesick, and he decided, I'm not doing this anymore. i got to go back home. And so he left, and Paul was mad. He was livid. He's going, what is wrong with these millennials these days? And so when Paul says, hey, Barnabas, let's go out and encourage the churches, Barnabas says, good, I'll go get Mark. And Paul says, oh, no, you're not going to go get Mark. We're not going. He abandoned us. That kid, he's unfaithful. He's not trustworthy. We can't go with him. The contention, they had a fight. It got so bad that finally Paul said, that's it. I'm not going with you anymore. I'm going to take Silas. And he goes one way, and then Barnabas goes and gets Mark, and he goes another way. Now something happened in the midst of time, and all of a sudden he says, hey, Mark's with me, and if he comes to you, you, you know what to do. You greet him. You welcome him. Apparently something happened. We're going to talk about, we'll get the true E Hollywood behind the scenes story as we go through this series, all right? We'll find out what happened. Verse number 11, a Jesus who is called justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Oftentimes you'll find the apostle Paul was resisted by the Jewish people, by his own brethren. In fact, there was one point where they had a bunch of guys that were fasting until Paul was dead. They were waiting to kill him. And that's how serious they were about it. And yet these three guys hung with him, his own brethren, and they were comforting him. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, we're not going to cover this verse in the series because we already covered it in our prayer series. So if you need to go back online and listen to that and find out what that's all about, that's a great prayer to pray. In fact, I've adopted that and started praying that for you guys, and I believe that God is bringing that prayer to pass in your lives, that you're able to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Verse 13, for I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Here's two men that we see another contrast. Luke was the beloved physician. He, He was a doctor. He was somebody that helped out in the process of healing. And yet, Luke is also that same Luke that bears the name of the gospel of Luke, and he's also the writer of the book of Acts. He was a companion of Paul, and he says this, Luke is a beloved physician. Now, he names another guy by the name of Demas. 
Now, Demas here is greeting the church, and he's with Paul. But if you fast forward to 2 Timothy chapter, uh, I believe it's number four, where he starts to talk about, I'm, I've been abandoned. I'm the only one that's here. I, I, I'm all alone. And he says, only Luke is with me. Luke stayed faithful. Luke hung around, and he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Once again, something happened in his heart, and he didn't stick around. See, not everybody that's around you in church is always going to be here. But don't get discouraged when people leave. You be like Luke, and you stick around. You hang in there with the things of God. Can somebody say amen? Verse 15, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church that is in his house. Now stop right there for a second because some of you guys might have a, a different translation of that. Some of you guys might have a translation that says, and greet Nympha and the church that is in her house. Can I tell you something for a second? Can I get on a soapbox for a moment? Do you guys mind if I just preach this verse for a second right here? Because I don't believe that God has any problem with women being in ministry. And if you have a problem with that today, you are welcome to go and find a church that preaches something else. Hello? Because I believe that God would not cripple half the body of Christ from doing the work of the Lord. And the Bible tells me in the New Testament, under the new covenant, when Jesus went to the cross, now as we enter into that new covenant relationship, that we are new creations, and there is no longer slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female. God's not hung up on your gender. In fact, even in the Old Testament, before Jesus went to the cross, there was a woman by the name of Deborah who was a prophetess and judge of the nation of Israel. She led men. She prophesied to men. She taught men. She told them how to live life. And God had no problem with that. So what makes us think under a better covenant, with better promises, with better blood, that there wouldn't be better Ministry for women in the church. And so the translators probably had a problem with a woman being denoted as a leader because anytime you see somebody say, greet this person and the church that is in their house, usually that meant that they were the pastor of that church because they didn't have buildings like we did until the, the third century. And so they were the leader, they were the pastor, and they held church in their home, just like you see Philemon, the church that is in his house, he was most likely the pastor that was there, and now you see Nympha, and they probably said, oh wait, that would be a pastor, we, they, they've got to make, there's got to be a problem here, and so they changed it to Nymphas, and they said his house. But I believe that that was a woman in ministry who was a pastor of a church, and God had no problem calling that out in the book of Colossians. Can anybody say amen? I'm off my soapbox. It goes on in the next verse, and it says this in verse 16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, we don't have a book of the Bible called Laodiceas, right? There's nothing like that. So it's either a lost book of the Bible, or some people believe it could be the book of Ephesians. Some people believe it could be the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Can I tell you something? Doesn't really matter. We got this word, right? So let's stick with this. Then it goes on in the verse 17, it says, And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. We'll talk about that verse, verse number 18, this salutation by my own hand. Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul ends the letter by writing his own greeting as often he did in his letters. In one of the letters he says, see what big letters I use as I write to you. Paul, making sure that people knew that it was him and his authority was writing to them, just took time to write out. But he would often dictate these letters and have somebody else write them down for him, and then he would sign his name at the end in large letters so that they knew that this was legit. They knew that this was something that was coming with apostolic authority because there were people out there who were misusing and abusing the apostles' names and their ministries. And he closes out with grace be with you. Grace is God's sovereign and divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. He says, I want to impart power. I want to, I want to give you something in any. I want to just speak something over your life that will give you what you need to continue on. Al McGuire, who's a very famed NCAA basketball coach, won the NCAA championship tournament and then retired immediately following. Made him famous because people thought at the height of your career, why would you retire? And yet, he was a great coach, and really it wasn't about money or anything like that. He got a great job in a sports apparel company and continued to make more money and move on with his life because he knew that he had accomplished what he had done. 
And he was a great coach, and he had a player by the name of Butch Lee. Butch Lee was a great basketball player, Puerto Rican basketball player. And uh, so he pulled him aside, and he knew this guy was kind of a prima donna. You know what I'm saying? He knew that he was good, in other words. And, and so he sat with him, and he said, Butch, every basketball game has 40 minutes of play. That means that between the two teams, each team's going to have the ball for 20 minutes. Now, there are five players on each team. So in that 20 minutes, each player is going to get about four minutes of ball time. He says, now, Butch, I know what you can do with four minutes with the ball. But the question I want to ask you, Butch, is what are you going to do with the other 36 minutes of the game? And I believe that in the same way in the body of Christ, there are many of you who think that because you don't have the ball... Maybe you pictured it, I don't have a mic, I don't have a pulpit, I don't have a platform, therefore I'm not in the game. And yet, notice what the coach said, not every player always has the ball during the game. It doesn't make them any less a part of the team because they're sitting waiting for the ball to get passed to them. Or because they're running ahead getting ready for a screen. Or or because they're getting in position so that they can get the ball for one second and pass it on to somebody who's going to shoot and score. They are still a part of the team. They're still in the game. They're still doing something significant. And most of the time in the body of Christ, we think that because we're not the preacher, we're not the pastor, we're not the paid minister from the church or the ministry, that we're not a part of the team. Can I tell you something today? There are 36 minutes in your lifetime that you are playing the game and you're a part of the team. What are you going to do for the Lord? Because if you're a Christian... You are doing the work of the Lord, and you are a part of the workforce of Almighty God. You're playing the game. You're on the team, and there are times where the ball will get passed to you, and you got to know what to do when that time comes, but you also have to know what you're doing the rest of the time. We're all involved in doing the Lord's work, and when doing the Lord's work, some things take place. I need you to get a hold of these principles today because it will take you from a place of just kind of being on the sidelines to getting in the game, to knowing your position and to doing it Well, you can be an effective minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that you say and in everything that you do. So I'm going to bring some things out today from these verses in the book of Colossians when doing the Lord's work. First one is this that I noticed by these men and women that we just got a chance to look into their lives and to see what was going on. First thing is this, when doing the Lord's work, small things become great. Small things become great. Nothing we do for God is too small. I should have had a, at least a weak, pathetic amen on that one. Nothing we do for God is too small. Amen. There's no thing that you can do for the kingdom of God that is too small. Jesus said if you have faith just as a little teeny tiny mustard seed, and you sow that seed, if that's all you got, if that's all you can do, he says when you do that in the kingdom of God and you plant that seed of faith, guess what happened? God blesses it and it grows not just into a mustard bush, but into a mustard tree, supernatural, large growth. God takes those small things and he makes them great. There's nothing that we do for God that's too small. Many of the people that you see here in Colossians chapter 4 are not noticed as apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, but their names are still in the Bible for what they did do. Think about Tychicus. What was his job? Great apostle? Prophet Tychicus? No. Postman Tychicus. He was just carrying the mail from one place to the next. And yet, his name's in the Bible. Can I tell you something? My name's not in the Bible. Your name's not in the Bible. You say, well, your name's in the Bible. Book of Daniel, right? Another guy. Daniel Harold Roth Jr. is not in the Bible. My name's not in the Bible. Your name's not in the Bible. But Tychicus, his name's in the Bible. Why? Because he faithfully did something, something small. But it was significant for the kingdom of God. And something so small as just carrying a letter and finding out how people are doing. Now, this guy gets recorded as one of the great men and women that gets their name recorded in the pages of our Bible. Little did Tychicus know that when he delivered this letter from the apostle to the people, that for thousands of years from then on, people would be studying the words of that letter and finding out how to live life today. Nothing we do for God is too small. 
They carried letters, they brought news, they brought comfort, they brought encouragement, they brought a welcome, they prayed for the church. And you may have thought that your part in the body of Christ was insignificant because you aren't carrying the ball, and yet God records your name in the annals of heaven. And when the story is told, when we get to heaven, and when God opens the books and rolls out the scrolls, he's going to read your name and talk about what you did with your time while you were here on the earth. You are doing the Lord's work. There's a man by the name of Edward Kimball. He's a Sunday school teacher in the Illinois area. And uh, he had a group of boys that he was teaching in Sunday school. He took this position very seriously and prayed for each one of those boys by name. And in fact, he even took their salvation upon himself. He said, I'm going to make sure that personally I want to see each and every one of these boys that are in my Sunday school class saved. And so he went after them. He prayed for them. He preached to them. And he realized that one of the boys wasn't really getting it. He wasn't really understanding the gospel message. So he went and he found him in his job. Went down, this man was a shoe salesman. And so he went to this young man in the shoe store, and he found them back in the, in the supply room, stocking the shelves and that sort of a thing. And so he started to talk to him, started to preach to him the gospel and minister to him the message of Jesus Christ, that there's salvation through his name, that he needed to surrender his heart and life to Jesus. And there in the supply room of a shoe store, a young man by the name of Dwight L. Moody gave his heart and life to Jesus. Now, many of you know D.L. Moody, right? There's a Bible institute by the name of Moody Bible Institute that's named after this great man. He ministered and impacted two continents for Jesus, as well as ministering to thousands upon thousands of people. Moody, in his meetings, had a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman. Now, Wilbur Chapman came to Christ and was touched by God, and he became another evangelist who preached to thousands. And one day, he was ministering in a meeting, And there was a man who was a baseball player who had the day off and decided to go and decided to take a look at what was going on at the revival meeting with Wilbur Chapman. That man gave his heart and his life to the Lord, that baseball player, and he left baseball and he became an evangelist. His name was Billy Sunday. Many of you guys know of Billy Sunday. Many of you guys have heard of him. Traveled around and preached the gospel and had revival meetings. He was one of the guys that first started to bring people to the altars, started to make that popular. And he was a fiery preacher. In one of his meetings, he was going to, he was going to hold revivals in Charlotte, and he enlisted the help of a man by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham was an eighth generation minister, and yet he ran from the call of God and went and got his degree in law and started to practice law, but he could not run from the call of God in his life. And so he started to minister, started to go out and do revival meetings, and, and, and he had some messed up theology in some areas, but he continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, faith in his name for salvation. And, and in his meetings, oftentimes he, would, he wasn't beneath doing things that would just shock people. And so he would ride around in a hearse and invite people to the revival meetings. And it caused a lot of buzz and got people to come. And there in Charlotte, North Carolina, he had a revival meeting and a young man responded to the message by the name of Billy Graham. It's estimated today that 2.2 billion, I said billion with a B, billion people have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ through the ministry of Billy Graham today. All because one man decided to take personally the little Sunday school class, Edward Kimball, praying for his students and making sure that they knew the gospel of Jesus Christ personally. There's nothing too small that we do for God. You may have thought, but pastor, it's just Pastor is just checking people in at the children's ministry. Pastor is just changing diapers. Pastor is just sweeping up after the food distribution ends on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Pastor, it's just driving a shuttle, bringing people to church. Pastor is just greeting at the back door. Pastor, it's just ministering the gospel to somebody at work. Pastor, it's just a little Bible study that I hold on our breaks. Pastor, it's just prayer time at night. Everyone should be doing that, shouldn't they? It's just a small thing, Pastor. It's not that much. Pastor, it's just ministering to my kids and making sure that they grow up knowing the scriptures and serving the Lord. Pastor, it's just being a good grandma or being a good grandpa. Pastor, it's just helping out and folding letters here in the office and and making sure things are taken care of and and, and just doing my part, Pastor. It's just, it's just a prayer meeting before church. It's just a a, a world prayer meeting in between services. Pastor, it's just ushering. It's just, just passing a bucket. Pastor, does that have significance? See, when you place the things that you do and you do the Lord's work, you take those small things and you put them in the master's hands, those small things become great things to God. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 10 in the New Living Translation says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. 
to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the world. See, God is looking for people that will just start the work. God doesn't want a lazy sideline church that's not in the game. You are not called to spectate. You are called to participate. God doesn't want you sitting on the sidelines cheering someone else on. You go, pastor. Go ahead and do the work of the ministry. I'll fund the tithe and make sure that you do it. You save some. No, God's saying, get in the game. But God, it's just, God says, it's just a plumb line. It's just a little piece of string with a rock on it. And yet, did you know that God delivered the nation of Israel from Goliath, a giant, and a massive army with a little piece of string and a rock? God takes those small things that we place in his hands, and he makes them great things. Second thing is this, when we do the work of the Lord, second thing is this, is that the secular becomes sacred. The secular becomes sacred. If you don't understand what I mean by that, secular is speaking to things outside of the realm of the church, right? Right? Those things outside of the things of God. Oftentimes we separate those things in our minds. Well, this is church and this is my life. This is holy and this is unholy. This is God. This is special. This is me and this is regular. And God says, I want your entire life to merge. I want it, listen, just like the tithe. If the tithe is holy, then the whole part is holy, right? It's all blessed. If the, if the little measure that you pull out is holy, then the whole lump is holy, that's what the Bible says. And in the same way, if Sunday's holy, can I tell you something? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday are also holy. And if you're a Christian, then you take your life, your secular life, your everyday living and breathing life, your work life, your love life, your home life, your community life, your friendship life, you take your finance life, you take your future life, you take all that you are and you place it in the hands of God and now all of a sudden the secular becomes sacred. God is the transformer of our souls. When we take our natural dead life, he brings it alive. He takes our darkness and he makes it light. And in the same way, if you will take your work, your job, your home, your family, your finances, your future, your dreams and your vision, and when you place it in the hands of God, the secular will become sacred. I was in Washington, D.C. last year with my family. We took a trip during spring break and went and took a tour of the Capitol building beautiful, wonderful to see our nation. I'm, I'm so blessed to be where we're at. I believe this is the greatest nation on the planet. And as we were there in the Capitol building, they have all these statues all over the, the Capitol. Each state gets to take two people that they want to represent from their state and have a statue made and place that in our Capitol. So there are 100 statues in our cap Capitol building representing people of great notoriety from each and every state over the centuries that our nation has been in existence. I was blessed walking around seeing the great men and women that I knew of. George Washington, obviously, is a great one. Thomas Jefferson. and You know, you see our founding fathers. And there were different ones that we were looking at. And as I went through, I, I realized that there was another one. And I, I started to read the inscription on the bottom of it. It was a man by the name of Dr. Crawford Long. He discovered the use of sulfuric ether as an anesthetic in surgery in 1842. That was not interesting to me, by the way. What was interesting to me was the inscription underneath his tribute. And he says at the bottom, my profession is to me a ministry from God. My being a doctor, my profession is to me a ministry from God, just like Dr. Luke that we heard about in the Bible. See, it wasn't just something natural. It wasn't just something secular. It wasn't just an advance in medicine and science. No, it was a ministry from God. I'm going to ask you a question. I need a great big response. Here's how I want you to respond in case you were wondering. I want you to throw your hand up in the air. I want you to wave it just like you just don't care. And I want you to scream and shout and holler and hoot. I want to hear a big old woo when you say this, all right? How many full-time ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ do we have here in the Rock Church and World Outreach Center? That's what I'm talking about. Because all of us have a life that we live outside of this place. But can I tell you something? This is the training ground. This is the recharge station. This, this is the place where you come and you get built up. I'm just the cheerleader. I'm just the coach. I'm saying you can get out there and you can do it. Those 36 minutes when you don't got the ball, you're still playing the game. Get out there and be a minister of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a young woman by the name of Esther 
who became a queen over what was at that time the entire known world. There were a series of events you can read in the book that bears her name. Something happened. There was a plot to wipe out the Jewish people, and Esther was a Jewess, yet she was the queen. So where Uncle Mordecai comes and he says, Esther, you need to take your position and use it for the things of God because God is doing something through the Jewish people. And I need you to go before the king and I need you to talk to him about this plot to kill all of our people. She's very nervous and she says, you know, Uncle, if I go before him, I could die. Because if you go into the presence of the king uninvited, even though you are the queen, he could still have you put to death. And so she, in fear and trembling, was considering what she was going to do And this is what her uncle responds to her. And he says this in Esther chapter 4, verse number 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God has a plan on the earth and he's going to get it accomplished somehow in some way. You can either be a part of it or you can choose not to be a part of it. You're welcome to sit on the sidelines and watch as other people get out there and kill it in the things of God and do what they need to do. And yet, look at what he says, but you and your father's house will perish. In other words, Esther, you could die if you go before the king. You're going to die anyways if you don't because they're going to kill all the Jews and you'll be found out as Jewish and you will die because of the king's edict. It can't be changed. And then look what he says, yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom secular for such a time as this, sacred. Who knows? Who knows whether you were born in the Inland Empire in this day and this age for such a time as this. Who knows if you got that job in corporate America for such a time as this? Who knows whether or not you decided to get involved in politics for such a time as this? Who knows whether or not God has graced you in your retirement for such a time as this? Who knows if God gave you those children that are just rebellious for such a time as this? Who knows if God put you in that house surrounded by that crazy community for such a time as this? God wants to use you to go into the secular and create a sacred environment. God wants to take that which is unholy and make it holy. God wants to redeem those natural things to be supernatural things on the earth. When we place it in the hands of God, the secular becomes sacred. Last one for us today is this, is that simple temporary endeavors become eternal. Simple and temporary endeavors become eternal. Eternal. Too often we get our focus on temporary things rather than eternal. Just like Esther, I could die temporary rather than getting involved in the plans of God, eternal. We think that the things that we're doing are just natural and just temporary, and yet God says they go before us into eternity. There's a story towards the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 26. If you want to turn there with me, go ahead. In Matthew chapter number 26, Jesus is having dinner at the house of a guy by the name of Simon. Simon is noted to be a leper, not a leopard. He wasn't a cat. He was a man, but he had a sickness that ate away at his body. Jesus probably had healed him, and now here he is sitting and reclining at his table, having dinner at his house. The disciples are all with him, and while they're eating dinner, something crazy happens. Something uh, just outside of what normally should go on happens. A woman comes in. A woman comes in and breaks open an alabaster box of perfume and spike nard. She pours it over the head of Jesus. Jesus is the rabbi. He's the teacher. He's, he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. What is this woman doing coming and pouring this oil over his head? And the disciples get indignant and they start to say, what a waste. Why did she just break that open? What's going on here? Judas speaks up. He's the treasurer of the group. He was also skimming off the top. He said that money could have been given to the poor. Really what he's saying is I'm really poor and I need some more money to line my pockets. He was a thief. Jesus rebukes him and says, leave her alone. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 12 and verse number 13. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 12. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to the grave. But I'm not going to stay there. Notice it was a temporary thing that was taking place. She poured the oil to anoint him for a three-day burial. He went to the grave Friday, Saturday was in there, Sunday morning. On the third day, he rose again. It was just a little thing. What a waste, God. What a small temporary thing. Why would she pour that out? She could have had that as her dowry for her wedding. She could have used that to to fund her life if she was a widow. She could have had that for herself. What a waste. What a temporary thing. Jesus wasn't staying in the grave. And yet, look at what he says in verse 13. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, 
What this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Can I tell you something, guys? For thousands of years now, all over the four corners of this round earth, the gospel has been preached. It's going out to all creation. It continues to be preached. And as we preach this gospel, just like you heard about it today, there is an eternal reward that this woman has because she did that for Jesus. She placed it in the master's hands. She placed it on the master's head. And now we're preaching about this little lady thousands of years later and on into eternity it will be remembered that she was the one who got to anoint Jesus for his his burial. And when you take your life, when you take your job, when you take your marriage, when you take your parenting, when you take your health and your finances, your home and everything that you are, and when you start to pour that out into the things of God, you might have thought it was a little temporary thing. You might have thought it was a little natural thing, and yet small things become great, and secular things become sacred, and temporary things go on before you into eternity. So my encouragement to you today is this. Let's go out and make an eternal impact by doing the Lord's work in all that we do, everywhere we go, and at all times. You may not have the ball, but it's coming your way soon. You may not have the ball, but you're still a part of the team. You may not have the ball, but guess what? You are out there doing the Lord's work. You are part of his workforce. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise today. Come on, hallelujah. As we always do, I like to have a moment to respond to the word of the Lord. So would you just take a moment and let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, God. We receive it with meekness. With no one getting up, no one leaving. This time is not time to go yet. Church is not done. What is God speaking to you? Maybe you already know. God's already said something to you. You wrote it down. But maybe you haven't really heard from God's voice yet. Specifically personally and intimately and you want to turn that question into a prayer God what are you speaking to me through this message maybe God's saying to you you've been despising the day of small beginnings but I'm rejoicing to see the plumb line in your hand today you need to change your heart and recognize that that's a ministry from God that's the Lord's work that you're part of the workforce that little small thing is great in the eyes of God and he'll turn it into something much greater than you ever could imagine your job is to be faithful for some of you maybe you haven't allowed the secular and the sacred to come together and to be transformed maybe you need to take a moment and repent and take your life outside of this place put it in the hands of God and say God I, I want this to be holy This is your time. I'm in the game, God. You want to commit your life outside of church to God and His care. Maybe God's speaking to you and saying, lift up your eyes. Quit looking at the temporary things. Start to look on into eternity. And realize that those things that you're doing now have an eternal impact change the way that you live. Some of you, maybe God's putting a call to get involved in church, to volunteer and serve here in the house. Maybe you want to sit one on Sunday morning and serve one on Wednesday night. Sit one on Sunday night and serve Saturday morning. Be a part of the team here. Right after church, if God's speaking that to you, they do have volunteer applications at the Information Center. Go grab one. Pray about it. Fill it out. And drop it back off with us and get involved. Do something here in the house. But also realize that that's not the only part of the game. When you're out there in the world, there's going to be doors that are open to you where the ball gets passed and it's your turn to preach the gospel. It's your turn to minister to somebody. It's your turn to pray. It's your turn to believe. Step out in faith. Maybe 
but just by way of commitment, if God spoke something to your heart that you want to commit back to his care and you say, God, I need grace. God, I can't do this on my own. Lord, I want you to touch this. I want you to empower this. Would you just, by, by way of response, do something in the natural. Would you just raise up a hand to heaven? Just a, a, a symbolic of, God, I'm committing this thing that you've spoken to me back to your care. Just lift up a hand right now to heaven. I'm going to pray for those of you with your hands raised right now. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every hand raised in this place. God, we thank you for the word that you spoke to us today. And God, those things that you've given to us, we commit back to your care. And we say, Lord, we will do our part. We will be faithful. And God, we know that you'll do your part. Will you empower us by your grace to do great things, even though they may be small in our eyes, to do holy and sacred things, even though they may be natural in our minds, God, and to do things that are of eternal value. God, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement said, amen and amen. Come on, can we give the Lord one more great big praise today? Hallelujah.